I'm going to talk about sleep and healthy aging. And thanks to the uh, organizers for having me, and uh, thanks to the audience for their attention through the lunch hour here. By way of disclosure, I was uh, an officer of the American Thoracic Society a number of years ago. <clears throat> I do have some industry um, connections there that I don't think are relevant to today's presentation, but I'll disclose them there for completeness. The vast majority of my funding comes from the National Institutes of Health. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about two topics uh, which should complement what Dr. Lee has just addressed. One is about sleep deprivation, and the other is about obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is a very common condition, as we'll talk about. So uh, we put out this statement in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine a few years ago that was supposed to inform Healthy People 2020, which is a document the federal government puts out uh, to inform uh, healthy behaviors. And this is an official statement that made the recommendation that almost all of us require between seven and nine hours of sleep at night. There are plenty of people who think they do well with less sleep than that, but the vast majority of them uh, get into trouble with less sleep. There are two famous examples of uh, people that said they did well on short sleep. And uh, one was Margaret Thatcher, the other was Donald Trump. You can draw your own conclusions about what sleep deprivation might do, at least for some individuals. People that do this work measure things in alcohol equivalents, how much do you have to drink to make your brain deteriorate versus how much do you have to be sleep deprived. You can see uh, over 18 hours of sleep deprivation. So if you wake up at six in the morning and go to bed at midnight, over the course of that 18 hours, there's some minor deterioration in brain function about on the order of one or two drinks. It's not a big effect, but it's measurable. But with 24 hours of sleep deprivation, you're actually legally drunk as far as your brain performance is concerned. So doctors in training would routinely stay up all night and as far as brain performance is concerned, it's not ideal. Uh, so this is a complex slide, but let me go through it uh, carefully to make a couple of points. <clears throat> On the y-axis here is the Stanford sleepiness score, and that's a subjective measure of daytime sleepiness. The y-axis here is the psychomotor vigilance task. That's an objective measure of brain function. So this is objective brain function. This is subjective sleepiness. And what they do is they bring people into the lab at University of Pennsylvania and sleep deprive them. So these are people getting total sleep deprivation. You can see they get more and more sleepy, not surprisingly. But with total sleep deprivation, there's more and more lapses on the psychomotor vigilance task, saying that the brain is deteriorating with total sleep deprivation. Again, not surprising. You sleep eight hours per night. Your levels of sleepiness are quite stable in terms of subjective sleepiness. Your objective brain performance is also reasonably stable with eight hours of sleep at night. What's more interesting are these curves. If you get six hours of sleep or four hours of sleep, your subjective sleepiness gets worse. Your objective brain performance with six hours with four hours also gets worse. But what's interesting here is the following. These curves have plateaued after a couple of days. So you have this, you ask this guy, are they sleepy? Yeah, I'm sleepy, but I'm used to it. And uh, that's pretty flat over the, the past 10 days or so. There's no hint of a plateau in either of these curves suggesting brain function is deteriorating while subjective sleepiness is quite stable. So the take home message from this slide is that we lose the ability to perceive how sleepy we are. The subject of sleepiness is quite stable while objective brain performance is deteriorating. We don't realize how sleepy we are, or how impaired we are when we're sleep deprived. The other thing that's interesting is that six hours and four hours look superimposable on this graph in terms of subjective symptoms. So there's clear separation with six hours and four hours of sleep shown here. So you can hear the conversation now. Somebody says, well, I might as well stay up all night because I'm going to feel crummy tomorrow, no matter what. And that might be true as far as subjective sleepiness is concerned, probably not for objective brain performance. And so again, there's a dissociation between symptoms and performance as far as the brain is concerned. There are other health factors though that are important in terms of sleep. So this is a paper we published in the Archives of Internal Medicine almost 20 years ago now. It was one of the first studies looking at the consequences of short sleep. And this is looking at incident heart disease or myocardial infarction. And in the nurse's health study back in 1986, they're asked, how many hours do you sleep in a 24-hour period? And they answer the question here on the x-axis. The relative risk is shown here. So sleeping eight hours per night, the relative risk was one, meaning baseline risk. You slept seven hours per night, as far as sleep is concerned, risk went up trivially. With six hours per night, it went up about 30%. And with five hours per night of sleep, risk of a heart attack went up about 70%. Now, the first thing people say is, well, the data are confounded. Sicker patients will sleep less and sicker patients have heart attacks. And that's true. The nice thing about a sample size of 72,000 
is you can control for whatever you want, but control for all the known covariates and these data are independent of any known covariates. It's not age or gender or depression or anxiety or personality or any of the things you think might be important as far as affecting sleep duration and risk of heart attack. It's not any of those things. And there's other subsequent mechanistic data that come out suggesting short sleep may increase the risk of a heart attack. If you're into risk equivalent, sleeping five hours per night is about on the order of a cholesterol of 250 milligrams per deciliter. So high enough you'd start a statin like Lipitor or some atorvastatin, some one of those kind of medications. So what happened during COVID was one of the things they asked us to address. And unfortunately, our labs are shut down for many months during the pandemic. And so a woman I work with, Laura Crotty Alexander, and I published this paper in the American Journal of Cardiology in 2020. But what we did was a Twitter survey. Why did we do a Twitter survey? Because our labs were closed and we didn't have any other way to get data. And so we had surveyed people during the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, how much are you sleeping? It turned out people are going to sleep later, waking up later, but in aggregate, the sleep had improved by about an hour. And the reason that was interesting is around that time, there was a report in the New England Journal of Medicine from Kaiser looking year over year where the risk of heart attack had gone down about 50% at the start of the pandemic, and nobody could quite figure out why. It turned out most things were going in the wrong direction. People were gaining weight. People were smoking more. There was more stress, more anxiety, all the things going in the wrong direction. The only thing we could identify that had improved was sleep. And so we thought maybe the increase in sleep that was seen early in the pandemic may have uh, led to some improvement as far as cardiovascular risk is concerned. Is increased sleep responsible for reductions in myocardial infarction or heart attack during the COVID pandemic? Short answers are not known. It looks like sleep duration is going back to where it was pre-pandemic now, but at least a natural experiment that's interesting. There's some data as well in terms of glucose uh, control and glucose tolerance. There's a group at University of Chicago, Karen Spiegel, Ezra Tassali, and Van Cotter, where they'll take normal people and sleep deprive them, and they measure uh, things during sleep deprivation. So a perfectly normal, healthy person starts to show impairments in glucose tolerance, something called glucose effectiveness is a harbinger of insulin resistance or diabetes, and that's impaired in a normal person if you sleep deprive them. The stress hormones like the fight or flight Adrenaline levels, these things go up. Cortisol, the stress hormone, goes up as well, and that may be part of the problem. Slow wave sleep or deep sleep seems particularly critical. If you suppress deep sleep, people start to look diabetic. There are also data in terms of appetite regulation. So leptin is a hormone that's made by fat cells that tells our brain to stop eating. And the fatter you get, the more leptin you make it, and hopefully you eat less as a result of that to regulate your appetite. Ghrelin is the opposite. It stimulates appetite. And so what this group did in the University of Chicago is they put people under constant glucose infusion. So it's not they're eating more or eating less. And they measured the level of these hormones and people getting either inadequate sleep with four hours per night or adequate sleep with 10 hours per night. You can see the leptin levels are suppressed and the ghrelin levels are increased with sleep deprivation. Both hormones went in a direction that be predicted to stimulate appetite. I'll say it again. Both hormones went in a direction that be predicted to stimulate appetite. And the reason that's interesting is that people believe that sleep deprivation may be a risk factor underlying the obesity pandemic. I'm trying to lose weight myself right now. I'm trying to sleep. Uh, the main point of this part of the conversation was that diet, exercise, and sleep are three pillars of health. And the dogma is if you ignore one, the other two will suffer. So three pillars of health, a diet, exercise, and sleep. If you ignore one, the other two will suffer. So Jeff Flyer, who was Dean of Harvard Medical School at the time this uh, came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine, wrote the editorial suggesting that sleep deprivation may be a risk factor underlying the obesity pandemic. When we saw that, we went back to the nurse's health study to see what happened to their body weight. You can see the body weight on the y-axis and the year on the x-axis. The women sleeping five hours per night weighed more at baseline than people sleeping adequately. And then they gained more weight over time over the 15 years than did people sleeping adequately. Everybody gained weight during this period, including me, but the five hour sleepers gained more weight but on the order of uh, five or 10 kilograms or, or uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds uh, with five hours of sleep compared to sleeping adequately. There have been some randomized trials as well where they randomize people to adequate sleep or inadequate sleep when they go on a diet. And so this was also published in the Annals of Internal Medicine where they looked at uh, sleep depriving people going on a diet. Sleep curtailment decreased the proportion of weight lost as fat by 55%, eight and a half versus five and a half hours. 
and increase the loss of fat-free body mass by 60%. What does that mean? The amount of human sleep contributes to the maintenance of fat-free body mass at times of decreased energy intake, that is going on a diet. Lack of sufficient sleep may compromise the efficacy of typical dietary interventions for weight loss and related metabolic risk reduction. This is something I tell my patients. If you wanna lose weight, you need to sleep adequately, otherwise the diet doesn't work. I also take care of some professional athletes and they're also aware that exercise is impaired by poor diet or by poor sleep. There are also some data on coronary heart disease and coronary calcium. Uh, the short sleepers, if people sleeping inadequately, will have more coronary calcium buildup as a marker of hardening the arteries or risk of heart disease. So I'll summarize that portion of the talk by saying inadequate sleep has health consequences. Your mother was right. Impaired brain function is not surprising. We've all experienced that uh, with young kids or with jet lag or uh, during medical training or what have you. Increasing their data on metabolic and cardiovascular risk, the data here are rapidly evolving. We didn't know anything about this topic 20 years ago. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about obstructive sleep apnea as well. It's a very common disease where people stop breathing when they're asleep. So by way of background, these stoppages in breathing can occur during sleep. It's a very common issue, as I mentioned. I'll show you some data on that. It's associated with neurocognitive and cardiovascular sequelae. So people with sleep apnea don't think as clearly, lose creativity, lose memory uh, consolidation, and may be a risk factor for Alzheimer's as well. We're not sure yet. And cardiovascular risk, there may be risk of heart attack and stroke, and there's a reason we take this disease seriously. Risk factors for sleep apnea include aging, nothing you can do about that. Obesity, hopefully diet and exercise and sleep can help you with that. And then male gender, nothing you can do about that either. Okay, so I'm showing this slide for a couple of reasons. This is my most famous patient. It's not a HIPAA violation because he tweeted this to 3.8 million people. That's Shaquille O'Neal, who's a basketball player. I'm a big LA Lakers fan. He was playing for the Celtics at the time, but it turns out he was a Lakers fan as well when he, uh, he was growing up. Now, the reason I'm showing this is he had moderate sleep apnea at the time that slide was taken. He tweeted that, so I'm not giving away anything confidential, but he's an elite athlete. Uh, he's in incredibly good shape. He doesn't look that way on TV, but he's uh, uh, very cut in terms of his musculature and all that. And despite that, he had moderate sleep apnea. So my main point here is that the stereotype of an older obese man is simply a stereotype. I have plenty of skinny women and postmenopausal women and thin people that have sleep apnea that don't look like the stereotype. The other reason I show you this is my wife says he makes me look thin. So um, these are some data on the global prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea. It's a paper we published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine about two years ago. We tried to estimate globally the number of people with obstructive sleep apnea. And it's hard because there are 197 countries and only about 17 of them had data. So we did estimates based on existing age, uh, body weight, gender distributions, tried to match on races and ethnicities and whatnot. And we came up with the estimate that there's about 936 million, almost a billion people worldwide who have an apnea hypopnea index more than five. That means they stop breathing or have a pause in breathing five times per hour or once every 12 minutes. That's sort of a minimal threshold for sleep apnea, but about a billion people meet that definition of sleep apnea. You have a stricter definition for sleep apnea, that is you stop breathing or have a breathing problem 15 times an hour, once every four minutes. That's about a half a billion people worldwide that have that. This is a huge problem. And uh, whatever solution we come up with has to be scalable to that extent. Now you might ask, who cares? Why does it matter if the people at home with sleep apnea, if they're not coming to see a doctor, leave them alone. You don't have to go impose diseases on people that don't know anything about it. The estimates are still that more than 80% of sleep apnea is undiagnosed and untreated. So we did this study as well in Switzerland. Raphael Heinzer is a former trainee of mine. We did this study, but also published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine six years ago now. We went into the community and did what's called polysomnography or sleep studies in people in the community. So these weren't people coming to the doctor or to the sleep clinic with a complaint. We went to them and did assessments on them. It turned out about 23% of women and about 50% of men had an abnormality as defined conservatively more than 15 events per hour. That is a breathing problem once every four minutes while asleep or 15 times per hour. So that conservative definition or cautious definition, 23% of women and 50% of men met the definition of sleep apnea. So why do we care? 
what turned out was predictive of hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes mellitus, and depression, all of which we take seriously. So the concept here is that sleep apnea is highly prevalent. You can't ignore it just because people aren't coming to the doctor. Um, and so that, that's why we take this disease seriously. Not all of them get cardiovascular benefit from CPAP. Why am I saying that? I'll explain that in a slide or two. But the take home message so far is that sleep apnea affects up to a billion people worldwide. The numbers vary with which criteria you use and what equipment you use. But you need to think about this global burden of disease before um, uh, moving much further. There was this study called the SAVE study that was published in the New England Journal about five years ago. This is looking at CPAP for prevention of cardiovascular events and obstructive sleep apnea. What the authors thought maybe was that you could treat sleep apnea and prevent heart disease. It turned out it was a negative study. It wasn't helpful. And when this came out, there's all kinds of press releases saying, well, maybe we don't have to take sleep apnea that seriously. And perhaps that's true, but the, the study had, uh, it was well done, but there were some limitations in terms of drawing rigorous conclusions. The conclusion that was drawn in the New England Journal of Medicine was that therapy with CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure for treating sleep apnea, plus usual care, as compared with usual care alone, did not prevent cardiovascular events in moderate to severe sleep apnea. And so you could say it's a negative study. And so in my view, we need better uh, therapies. People need to adhere to therapy. It doesn't work if it's sitting on the shelf. And so perhaps people need to use the CPAP more. And we need better treatments, which we're working on. We need to identify high-risk patients better, just a one-size-fits-all approach, giving every man in Switzerland a CPAP and expecting 50% of men in Switzerland to have cardiovascular benefits seems unlikely because they're not all at cardiovascular risk from sleep apnea. And we need more basic research regarding mechanisms, which is the main focus of my laboratory. But people often get a very dismissive attitude about CPAP, saying, well, the mask, the continuous positive airway pressure, nobody tolerates that. It's terrible treatment and nobody likes it. That's simply not true. It got a bad reputation, deservedly, 20 years ago because it was clunky and it didn't work so well. It's gotten better. It's still not perfect, but it's gotten better. So here's some data. There's a cloud where the information from the CPAP machines goes up to the cloud. We have more than 7 billion nights of data on the cloud now that we can analyze. There's a group called MedEx Cloud, which is an academic industry partnership uh, between uh, several academic centers and ResMed, the company that makes the equipment. I'll point out I get no personal financial income from either Medix Cloud or from ResMed, but they did give a philanthropic donation to our university. So if you look at the blue guys here, x-axis here is time, y-axis here is cumulative percent of patients. The blue guys, about 70% of patients given CPAP were adhered with therapy based on Medicare criteria, about 70%. That's pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good in terms of usual care. It's better than a lot of chronic medical therapies uh, that we give people inhalers and asthma or anticonvulsants and epilepsy, 70% for CPAP is pretty good. If you use modern technology though, patient feedback, so they get patient engagement, they get a thumbs up if they're doing well, they get helpful hints if they're doing poorly, then the adherence goes up to 87%, which is really quite good. And so a defeatist attitude about CPAP saying nobody uses it is really not appropriate. We did this study in 2.6 million patients looking at everybody who got a CPAP machine was able to plug it in. So it was all comers. And with 2.6 million patients, we're seeing about 75% adherence uh, with treatment. So this defeatist attitude about CPAP saying nobody uses it or nobody tolerates it is simply not true. So nasal CPAP is the treatment of choice. It certainly improves symptoms, improves blood pressure in terms of people with high blood pressure or reduces the risk of developing high blood pressure. It's transformative for some patients. I saw a patient this morning and said they can't sleep without it. And a defeatist attitude about CPAP is not justified. The data look pretty good. It was general acknowledgement that we need new therapies with ongoing research, and that's what we're doing. I'd like to stop there. Again, thank you for your attention. <music>